Welcome. I hope you are having a wonderful night, dear viewer. Tonight, I will be telling some terrifyingly scary stories. Make sure to leave your feedback on the comments so I can make this the best experience for you. And if you have any stories you would like me to tell, you can send them through the link in the description. Let's begin. Story 1 For those who don't know, the spandrel is the little room underneath the stairs. The bottom of my stairs had a landing. Under that landing was a little crevice, just big enough for a small child or two to crawl under the stairs. My younger brother and I used to hide from our father as often as we could. We would wait for him to pass out from one of his violent drunken stupors. It happened one day when my mother and brother were coming home from his baseball game. I had already been under the stairs for what seemed like an eternity. I am still haunted by the sounds that filled the airwaves of the house that night. My father screaming at the top of his lungs. My mom crying out in anguish. My little brother whimpering. Then the silence. Then the cackling maniacal laughter that turned into my father screaming my name. I remember being so scared that I couldn't even move. I stayed frozen clutching onto the stuffed rabbit that my brother had forgotten from the last time we needed to hide. I was there from sundown until sunrise. I snapped out of my immobility when I heard the neighbor knocking at the door. He knew my father's dark side and was always looking out for us when he could. He must have let himself inside because I heard him immediately make a phone call. I stayed until I heard another voice calling my name. I finally crawled out into the arms of a police officer. I watched as my father was put into a patrol car and taken far away. He was locked up in a psychiatric hospital. That event took place almost 12 years ago now. I hadn't spoken to my father since, nor would I ever again. He was deemed unfit for society and would spend the rest of his days tranquilized in a padded room. The house had been left in the care of my aunt and uncle. They had been renting it out for the last 12 years putting money away and paying off the mortgage in my name. Now that I was 18, the house would officially belong to me. I wasn't very keen on the idea of going back to my childhood slaughter, home. In fact, the very thought turned my stomach. Against my better judgment, against my better judgment, I made the move. It was hard at first, but after a couple months, I quite enjoyed having the house to myself. It wasn't all bad. I have amazing memories of my mom and little brother. I just focused on those, and eventually it started to feel like home again. A terrible lightning storm had knocked the power out. I decided to head up to bed and call it a night. There was no way I was finishing the stupid show I was watching. With my flashlight in hand, I made my way to the stairs. As I did, I tripped over my own two feet. My flashlight rolled underneath the staircase. I dropped to all fours to reach under to get it. Albeit silly, I had a terribly hard time reaching inside. The hair on my neck was standing. Something was telling me to be afraid. I felt around for my flashlight and recoiled when I felt something soft. When I pulled it out and shined the light on it, the fright was washed away. A warmth came over me as I hugged my brother's rabbit tight once more. I brought it with me up to bed. The thunderstorm raged on as I fell deep asleep with the rabbit in hand. In the middle of the night, my cell phone shook me from my sleep. I answered to hear the same voice of the officer that I had run to as a child. Hello, Mike, this is Officer Travis McKenna. Sorry for calling so late at night. I am calling to inform you that your father escaped from the psychiatric hospital earlier this evening. We are sending a squad car over to your house at this moment. We have no reason to believe he would be coming. There. Just to be safe, lock your doors and stay inside until the officer arrives. I thanked him and put my phone back on the charger. I basically sprinted downstairs and made sure the house was locked up tight. I never opened any of the windows, so those were always locked. Luckily, I had locked the front and back door as well. I went back up to my room and stood by the window. 
I gazed out into the thunderstorm, waiting to see the lights of the patrol car. With a flash of lightning, I saw a glimpse of a silhouette of somebody standing at the edge of the driveway. The figure disappeared before the next bolt tore through the sky. The sound of broken glass rang throughout the house. The front door slowly creaked open. I started to hyperventilate as footsteps could be heard climbing the stairs. Step, 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 step. I could hear somebody giggling as the footsteps became louder. Step, step, they were right outside of the door. The giggling then became laughter. I could feel my heavy heartbeat pounding in my chest. The doorknob started to jiggle. The laughter became a cackle. My father screamed my name as he pounded on the door. I hadn't even realized that I had crawled under my bed with a death grip on my brother's soft little rabbit. The banging on the door got louder and louder. My father screaming frantically trying to get inside. Flashing red and blue lights lit up the room. The door swung open and from under the bed all I could see was his bare feet. He screamed my name again as he walked slowly toward the bed. I heard somebody yell freeze from the doorway. The feet of my father turned and attempted to dash toward the officer. He didn't get one step before two bangs shot through the air. My father hit the ground, blood flowing from the wound on his neck. His gaze locked on mine. His hand reached for me as the light dimmed from his eyes. Still, I clutched my brother's rabbit. Story 2 I watched her walk towards the car in shock and fear. Mary, don't. She slowly turned around and gave me a kind, reassuring smile. Don't worry, Jay. I'll call you tonight, hum, without waiting for a response. She turned back to the car. Why was I so worried? The reason sat behind the driver's seat of the truck, with a Cheshire grin plastered on his face. Lucas had a reputation of not knowing the definition of the word no. Several women, and more secretly known a few guys, had whispered of trials and trauma at his hands. The fact that he had a police chief as a father made things no better. No one dared bat an eye. I went home and waited and worried. There stood Mary, smiling her signature smile. I immediately wrapped my arms around her, eyes beginning to tear up. Are we going to stand out in the hall all evening? She giggled, brushing past me and heading inside. Following her inside, questions began spilling from my brain and out of my mouth. What the hell were you doing with that creep? Have you lost your mind? What could you two possibly have in common? Laughing again, she turned around and gave me a knowing look. You. I said grimacing. We spent the evening as we usually did when we have a surprise sleepover. Laughter, delivery, wine, then bed. However, I awakened in the wee hours of dawn to Mary silently slipping out of the front door. I paused for a beat. We don't have secrets. This woman knows everything about me. But do I really know everything about her? Especially since she's keeping rather unusual company these days. With not another thought. I slipped on my shoes and my hoodie and slipped out after her. I caught sight of her, heading towards the park. I sped up silently, cursing every crunching leaf, every snapping twig. She exited the edge of the park and headed into the woods behind it. There was definitely something shifty going on, and I was going to find out what it was. I followed Mary's semi-tangible shadow through the maze of trees and darkness until I could see a bonfire burning in a small clearing. When I got closer, I felt my stomach drop. Holding Mary by her neck was Lucas. I began to run, but stopped dead in my tracks as Mary began to giggle uncontrollably. I didn't know how she could breathe, let alone laugh. Lucas tightened his grip and his eyes were a mix of cruelty and confusion. This only seemed to make her laugh harder. I then realized her face began to change. Her soft, round features became sharper, more angular. Her eyes widened and slanted, becoming the color of the night sky. And her teeth, her teeth became fang, like. Lucas, horrified, pushed her to the ground, stifling a scream. I watched as she landed on all fours, her talon, like hands digging into the earth. Lucas, she hissed, 
Next thing I knew, she pounced on him like a cat. Lucas, how many lives do you plan to destroy with these filthy, filthy hands? He was punching wildly at her, but it did nothing to deter her, opening her jaw way wider than humanly possible. She caught one of his hands and promptly began chewing. Lucas's scream filled the air, causing me to flinch. Angrily, Mary grabbed a handful of earth and shoved it in him to stifle the screams. You know you like it, she purred. Isn't that what you said as we screamed, as we screamed, as we cried, as we suffered? He was now sobbing, looking utterly defeated and bleeding out, no doubt. I stepped into the clearing and cleared my throat. Both their heads snapped towards me. Mary smiled slowly at me while Lucas stared at me pleadingly. I smiled and nodded at her, spun on my heels and made my way home. Something's wrong with Mary and that's just fine with me. Story three, I'm a retired major crimes detective and I've seen true evil three times in my career. All three were in the last decade of my career. I spent 12 years walking the beat before I had the opportunity to step in and assist a detective and assist a detective and ATS. I on a double homicide through my numerous connections from years on the streets. We managed to get several leads that led to the arrests of the guilty. I moved out of patrol and spent a decade investigating sex crimes, arsons, and armed robberies. I took advanced training seminars and workshops, studying past cases and offender modalities. I worked with the drug squads on serious assaults and the occasional murder before finding myself stepping in for a retiring detective. I was familiar with his partner, Connolly, and we became a good team. I bring this all up to emphasize that. I've seen horrific shit in my 33 years on the force. Images I'll never shake. People who still haunt my dreams. I can honestly say that most of the criminals I've put away haven't been evil. They've all been motivated by something, however benign, to commit their acts. Then there are some that are on the fence. The ones that take violent crimes further than would typically be the case. And then there are those that dream up horrific atrocities to be inflicted on the world around them. Because why not? Patty Wilson fell somewhere beyond the shades of your typical serial killer. She was the first person I encountered on the job who I could reliably say had true evil in her. Patty was an ERN that had moved into a birthing clinic in one of the city's lower class neighborhoods. This particular clinic had a terrible miscarriage and still birth rate but the numbers were fudged and kept hidden. Eventually, people in the neighborhood started talking and word got out of how many deaths there were. Our station was contacted and normally that type of thing would land on another desk, but we were short staffed, so Connolly and I were brought in. Our investigation led us to Patty and we found that in her 23 years at the clinic, there'd been over 2000 miscarriages. She'd been giving a chemical cocktail to the expectant mothers claiming it would help with sleep. Instead, it gradually killed the fetus as it grew. We'd also discovered that after several dozen healthy births, Patty would take the baby away to be cleaned up, but would return with the horrible news that the baby had died shortly after being delivered. Our investigations into that didn't lead anywhere concrete, but one of the threads we were pulling on led us to believe Patty had been lying to the mothers telling them their baby had died when in fact the baby was healthy but was shipped off to the highest bidder. A live baby on the black market could fetch a tidy sum, whether for organ harvesting, stem cells, or something more deviant and horrific. We believed it was racially motivated, as almost all the miscarriages and stillbirths occurred exclusively with black parents. But Patty denied it all. I remember watching Patty in our first interview with her. Her face was normal and moved expressively as she spoke and answered our questions. But her eyes didn't. They were empty. Black holes and the longer you stared into them, the more uncomfortable you became. Even after the trial, which had her served with multiple life sentences, Patty denied any wrongdoing. The next case, where I witnessed true evil, it fractured into an investigation involving multiple events. Connolly and I were called in to investigate an attack on a beach volleyball tournament. On the city's largest beach, 
There was a national tournament with over 300 teams playing on 50 courts over the course of the weekend. The ages were from 12 to 65 and were both men and women. During morning, warm-ups before the first game on the first day, one scream turned into two screams, turned into a hundred screams. Over one-third of the players needed immediate medical attention. Their feet, ankles, knees, thighs, hips, stomachs, and in some cases up to their shoulders and face were covered in deep gushing cuts. Someone had gone to the beach the night before the tournament and brought hundreds of small flat pieces of wood with razor blades sticking up from the centers in an upside down capital T shape. The wood was dug into the sand with the blade's sharp end pointed upward and hidden just under the surface so no one could see them. It must have taken hours to set up. There were no deaths but the damage that was caused resulted in hundreds of injuries and several dozen athletic young adults with sliced Achilles tendons and a dwindling future in sports. As with every investigation, we started off at the crime scene and worked our way outwards in tight, concentric circles. While the Kessais were combing the beach, Connolly and I were interviewing the people who ran the tournament, looking for any enemies or people who might want to target them, and this tournament in particular. But those led nowhere. Sadly, the SIs fared no better. The entire crime scene was a wash. There were so many footprints and shoe and sandal prints in the sand. It was impossible to search for tracks. And the actual razor blades and pieces of wood had been doused in bleach before being placed in their small dugouts. There were no security cameras on the beach, and the lone one that was in the parking lot didn't capture any cars between the hours of midnight and 7 a.m. Our phones were ringing off the hook with tips, but there were no real leads. After a month, we were nowhere in the investigation. Then a new investigation came in and our hamstrung department got even tighter. Connolly and I took it on as well. At a senior's home along the city's waterfront, a fire had started in the basement. Because of the accelerants used, it quickly overtook the first two floors. From there, the rest of the eight-story building went up. We scoured the undamaged security footage, but again found no suspects around the parking lots or front entrances. The footage from the rear of the building was destroyed, so we couldn't check it. Then a third investigation dropped onto our desks. This time, there was a mass poisoning in a junior high school cafeteria. There were 23 deaths, 15 of which were students and over 100 severe injuries. Our investigation showed that someone had stealthily broken into the school overnight and poisoned every piece of food in the cafeteria stockroom, fridge, and freezer with arsenic. It was a miracle more people didn't die. All the school's exterior cameras were working, and after scouring them for clues, we finally found one at the back doors. The footage captured someone dressed in all black, with a hood and ski mask over his face. He'd used a small set of lock picking tools to enter the back door, which led to the kitchen. He used the same door to exit and ran off across the soccer field towards the water. And everything made sense. The beach volleyball courts, the seniors home, and now this junior high. They all backed out onto the water. The school itself had taken advantage of that fact by introducing students to rowing, kayaking, sailing, swimming, and other sports and activities on the open sea. And the senior's home was partially marketed based on its incredible view of the water. We hypothesized the three mass crimes were committed by the same individual. We marked all three locations on a map and scanned down the coast for all the marinas and harbors. Then we went back through all the routes and picked out various waterfront hotspots we knew would have footage of their exteriors. Using the dates of the three incidents, we cross. Check the footage to try to find any repeat boats on the nights in question. We watched a lot of footage. There was only one boat that stood out. A large, older black speedboat being driven by a lone individual we couldn't make out details of. A red light glowed from inside the cabin. Connolly and I got pictures of the boat printed and went back to check the marinas and harbors. None of the docks we went to had seen the particular boat or had records of it, which made us think it was docking at a private residence. 
I spoke to one of my friends in narcotics named Waco, and he brought up the drug boats that had been populating the cove near the last dock we visited. It turned out that the many drug users in our city had been moving away from alleyways and SROs and onto small dinghies and drug boats, turning them into floating pill houses. The boats were harder for cops to break up or investigate, and you could float in the cove or out in the nearby channel for up to six months before having to vacate. Of course, the six-month rule was never enforced, so the cove kept getting busier with more and more drug boats. Waco offered to help. He went in one night and made his way around the 30 or so boats, which were loosely tied together. Waco found our black boat. He learned the owner was a guy people called Red. He was a dealer and let people use and pass out on board his boat afterwards. The next night, Waco went back and we followed from a distance with the Coast Guard. We had Waco wired so we could hear everything on board. His plan was to get on with a few others to buy and use some heroin, then pass out. He would fake the shooting up part and pretend to fall asleep. Connolly and I listened in, hearing the details of the casual conversations going on from the other users as they bought and started prep. Soon enough, all the voices went quiet, including Waco's. A rough, agitated voice called out, asking if anyone was awake. There was no response. The voice belonging to Red laughed and said good. We heard some shuffling, then the engine on the boat rev into gear. The boat peeled out, leaving the cove behind. Waco had a GPS tracker in his shoe, so Connolly and I watched the boat on a monitor as it headed out to sea. We followed from a distance. The Coast Guard's lights all turned off and went completely stealth. Connolly and I continued listening in. After several minutes, the engine died down. There were sounds of chains rustling, then clanking together. Waco's voice came over the mic in a hushed and frantic whisper. He's chaining us together. There's an anvil on one end. Our captain flipped the lights and sirens on, and the boat gunned it towards the blip on our radar. Over the mic, we heard Red notice the sirens. He started to panic, and from what Waco told us, was about to toss the anvil over the side. But Waco was up and ready to fight. He surprised Red from behind and got him in a chokehold. When we arrived, Red was unconscious on the floor of the boat and Waco was sitting on his back. There were five users laying on the floor. They were all dead. Red had given them all spiked batches and they died minutes before. When we got back to land, interrogating Red was useless and terrifying. Useless because he said nothing. And terrifying because of how he said nothing. He'd bitten off his tongue moments before we got him in the room. He was in a hospital for the next day and a half before we sat him down with a pencil and paper. We didn't really need Red to talk though. There was more than enough evidence to put him away for the deaths of the five users on the boat. And then divers found more bodies along the same stretch Red boated on. Altogether, it appeared Red was responsible for the deaths of over 50 people and that didn't include the beach volleyball tournament, the senior's home, or the junior high school. The thing I remembered most about my brief time sitting across from Red during the interviews were his eyes. Just like Patty, I watched his face move and twitch and wrinkle, but his eyes were always the same empty black, holding my gaze. We never got a reason or motive for any of it. We found out he'd been in and out of foster homes up until his 16th birthday. Coincidentally, enough, there was a house fire which killed both his foster parents and two other kids living there. After that, Red disappeared for a few years, then got nabbed for an assault in a movie theater and spent his 20s in and out of prison. Who knew how much destruction Red had caused over the course of his life? My third experience with true evil was just as Connolly was nearing his retirement. Poetically enough, it was our last case together. We'd been investigating the individual abductions of six Caucasian women between 18 and 22. It was a little old for grooming gangs, and we ruled out human trafficking. We'd done a ton of legwork and repeat interviews with friends and family. No one went back on previous statements. Everyone was solid. We didn't have a single person of interest. We did have one connection between the girls. 
They all traveled in similar underground heavy metal and punk rock circles. They also appeared to have a similar fascination with Satanism. Connolly and I went back over the details of each disappearance and found they all coincided with a certain opening band that occasionally played at a weekly death metal show. They were called Helvet and were a Norwegian black metal band. They were known for covering themselves in what looked like blood and performing in masks. Each mask was different, but followed the typical design of a face with eyes, nose, and mouth. But the texture looked like dried skin. Dark, wicker twigs stuck out at the back of the head, resembling a porcupine. The more we read of them, the more they became our suspects. Connolly and I got an address and decided to go introduce ourselves. The place was on the outskirts of town, surrounded by a large plot of land and forest. We parked up the driveway, and I'll admit, the walk up to the house. I was feeling nervous. It was dusk and the sky was a darkening gradient of orange to dark blue. The residence itself was a large, old farmhouse. Death metal blared from somewhere inside, thudding out through the shuttered windows. There was a large black van parked out back and two sedans in the front. A scream erupted from the house, louder than the death metal rock. I pulled my 9mm and Connolly pulled his 38. We called for back, up and went in through the front door which was unlocked. The interior had a staircase to the right that led upstairs, and a hallway to the left that led to a living room, dining room, and kitchen. More screams erupted along with the pounding music. We could tell the screams were coming from below us and found a door leading to a staircase to the basement. The screams and music got louder and were joined by chanting. Connolly led, trigger fingered, creeping his way down the stairs. As he got to the bottom, Connolly swung out to clear the room, but someone was there. A tall mountain of a man in a dark mechanic suit, wearing one of the group's eerie masks, swung down at Connolly. Connolly saw it coming, firing his 38 into the guy. My right ear blew out, and my left was filled with ringing, chanting, and screaming. As I got my head back on, I saw that the man had swung down at Connolly with a hatchet, and it lodged in Connolly's neck. He fell back but continued firing into the far end of the basement. I let my 9mm lead me around the corner. There were old bed sheets hanging from the ceiling, obscuring my vision of the basement. The heavy metal kept pumping and the chanting grew, but the screaming had stopped. I wanted to check Connolly, but I needed to clear the room. I stepped over the body Connolly had shot and followed the chanting. It led me through the sheets and into a large opening. Dozens of red candles were lit. There was a circle drawn on the floor and inside it was an inverted pentagram painted in what looked like blood. In the far corner, the ground was dirt and I could see several graves protruding from the earth. At the center of the pentagram, a young woman wearing barely rags was chained to pegs in the ground and had just given birth. On each point of the pentagram around her were what appeared to be the remains of five recently delivered and now dead babies. Kneeling in front of the exhausted and crying woman was another band member, dressed similar to the previous Hulk, but smaller and with a slightly different mask. He held the newest, just, delivered baby in his hands as it cried. There were two other figures in the room, one over each of the kneeling guy's shoulders. The one to the right was holding a large, traditional, two-handed sledgehammer. The handle was thick wood, and the mallet was solid iron lined with carvings and covered in bodily fluids and innards. The guy on the left was holding an open book and had been guiding the others in the chanting. We all stared at each other in some strange, horrific standoff. The guy with the sledgehammer pulled first, lifting it to swing at me. I leveled up on him and walked two rounds into his chest before turning to the other two. The guy with the book threw it at me and lunged. I managed to get two more rounds off into him, but his momentum carried him through me and we hit the floor heavily. My head cracked the ground hard and I saw the familiar stars rushing the edges of my vision. Everything sounded like it was underwater, but was moving really fast. I managed to turn my head and saw the one remaining band member, the one holding the baby. He placed it on the ground at the center of the pentagram. 
He grabbed the sledgehammer from his dead friend and lifted it to slam down on the remaining baby. I didn't even realize it, but I still had my 9mm in my hand. Reflexively, I pulled the trigger repeatedly until it clicked empty. The final shot connected with the guy's head as he was about to swing down. He toppled back and the sledgehammer fell safely to the side. I don't remember much else after that. I woke up in the hospital and was informed Connolly had died, as had all the band members. The baby and the young woman had survived though. So there was that. The investigation was taken over by two other detectives and revealed that the band had been taking women from shows, bringing them back to the farmhouse and trying to impregnate them. Once they had gotten six pregnant, they planned a mass, ritual sacrifice to be conducted after the final birth as an offering to the devil in some Faustian bargain. The other women had been killed after their deliveries and were buried in the far end of the basement. I never saw any of the band members' eyes when they were alive because of the masks. Though I'm sure if I did, they'd carry the same darkness as Patty's and Red's. I said I'd seen true evil three times in my career, and that's true. But that last time, there was more to what happened than what I put in my reports. It's the reason I retired immediately after the case. It's the thing that made me realize there was an evil I couldn't even begin to comprehend. I'd seen it right when I got into the basement and leveled off my 9mm at the three men. There was something else down there with us. It was floating in the middle of the circle, kind of like black smoke, but it stayed in place, wafting together before separating and reconnecting. Bolts of red electricity shot through it. The smoke got larger as the chanting grew. What gives me nightmares now is thinking about if that last baby had been killed and the smoke finished solidifying. I'm terrified that whatever it would have manifested into would have shown me another realm of evil.